received. I want to let everybody know that um, we are going to have uh, hopefully maybe some time for Q&A. And so on the bottom of your screen, there's going to be some options and uh, Q&A should be one of them. If you don't see it, you can click the three little dots that says more, and then you might see that there. So if you have any questions for our uh, poets who are here with us today, um, or anything around the topic that we're going to be talking about, um, please feel free to um, put those there. So hello. Um, to get started, I just want to say welcome to everyone. We're so glad that you are here um, for this very special event um, where we get to honor and learn from not one, but two Washington State Poet Laureates. Um, we are here today to celebrate two sacred entities in our world, poetry and salmon. And to quote Alea Ahmad, a seven-year-old poet published in Priest's incredible anthology, I Sing the Salmon Home, which we're here to celebrate today. Everything in the life of human is a cycle. The world is part of that cycle. We are salmon people. My hope for today is that we can gain a deeper understanding of the importance of this miraculous fish and how their lives are deeply entwined with our own, how we too are salmon people. To begin, I would love to introduce our two wonderful guests today, Arian True and Rena Priest. KCLS is so grateful to host them and hold this space for their art. Uh, so Arian True is here with us today, who is from the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations. They are a queer poet and teaching artist from Seattle and has spent most of her time working with youth. She's received fellowships and residencies from Jack Straw, the Hugo House Artist Trust, and the Seattle Repertory Theater and is a proud alum of Hedgebrook and of the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She lives near the Salish Sea with her cat. And Arian is the 2023 to 2025 Washington State Poet Laureate. Welcome Arian and thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and hi everyone, welcome to the very cozy lighting. Um, this, is, this isn't a screen error, this is actually the lighting. It's very cozy. And Arian is wearing a really awesome fish shirt in celebration of this event, which I think is so fun. <laughs> um, all right, and now to introduce Rena. Rena Priest uh, is an enrolled member of the Loch Tumish, uh Lummi Nation. She served as the sixth Washington Poet State Laureate or Washington State Poet Laureate from 2021 to 2023, and was named the 2022 Maxine Cushing Gray Distinguished Writing Fellow. Priest is also the recipient of an Allied Arts Foundation Professional Poets Award and fellowships from the Academy of American Poets, Indigenous Nation Poets, Mia Taro, and Vadon Foundation. Her debut collection, Patriarchy Blues, received an American Book Award. Her second collection, Sublime Subliminal, was published as the finalist for the Floating Bridge Press Chapbook Award. Her most recent book, Northwest Know How, Beaches includes poems, retelling of legends, and fun descriptions of 29 of the most beloved beaches in the Pacific Northwest. Priest nonfiction has appeared in High Country News, Yes Magazine, Seattle Met, and elsewhere. She holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. Welcome, Rena. We are so happy to have you here. Thank you. Pleased to be here with you today. Yay. And we are here today um, to, as I said, celebrate poetry and salmon. And I wanna talk a little bit about um, the edited anthology. I have it right here with me with some sticky notes. Um, I sing the salmon home. And this is actually a, a library copy too, which is, which is great. Um, so in 2023, Rena edited the anthology, I sing the salmon home, which we are here to celebrate today, featuring poems from middle schoolers, retired teachers, psychologists, fishermen, longshoremen, arborists, first time poets, and much more. Um, this collection is a delight and an invaluable archive of the human devotion to Pacific Northwest salmon. In the words of the author, Timothy Egan, at long last salmon, the soul of the Pacific Northwest have been given words to match the ongoing miracle of their existence. With this anthology, some of the better poets from our corner of the world show us dimensions of life, legacy, and culture that we might otherwise overlook in our rushed tumble through the years. It's a book to grow old with, 
and a book to share with those just learning the power of verse to change hearts and minds. So with those words, I would like to begin our time together with a reading of poetry from Arian True and Rena Priest. Arian, would you, you like to start us out? Sure, can do. Um, Thank you. I also have the book. Mm -hmm. um, so I have um, a poem in here. Thanks, Rena. Um, and it's called Diadromus, which is a fish word. It's a salmon word. This fall, which is every fall, the salmon will return to the stream behind my house. They will wait in the sound for a high enough tide to make the trip up through the estuary where crows and gulls pick the eyes out of carcasses and through the culvert that, when I was small, I could fit through but feared. I did walk it once, 16, young feet unsure in the muck, pants rolled above the knees but still wet from the splash, my friend ahead of me all pressure and shame. But I did make it through to where the salmon in the fall will wait to jump their first jump upstream in our creek. I made it back, too, to the beach where the gulls toss young crabs and chase each other. Last time I was there, I checked the culvert and it seems small now, impossible for my teenage body, only broken glass and spiders. When they make that jump, the salmon keep swimming up, pausing in pools. Their bodies move like current. You can almost see the water inside them. Their bodies are half gone, some, in the missing chunks and peeling skin. Did you know salmon don't eat on their way home? They metabolize their tissues like a tree keeping warm, burning its branches. This whole time, it's all smell. Memory of scent guides them back, though it's been years. When they are young and leaving the stream, ocean bound, they turn one last time to look home and let every scent of it wash through their porous bodies. I mean, literally wash through their porous bodies to remember. I moved home last year. I don't mean to Seattle, I mean to the neighborhood I grew up in, have been avoiding perhaps at times. My city changes so fast and memories overlay developments until I don't know what I'm seeing or when, but this part of town is the same as when I left. There are still so many old trees, tall or gnarled, even from my new window. Most of the houses are still houses somehow and the roads are still wide and quiet. The sidewalks still cracked where heavy roots break them. I can see the mountains from the ridge and from the same spot turn around and see the grocery store's high tower like a foam car antenna ball stories above the parking lot, which is still a strip mall of businesses whose signs have watched me grow up the same neon. For a while, I didn't think I could come home to here, but this is where we could afford and something said, come back, said, rest a while, stay. I am a poor planner, but I trust my nose, can sniff out home when the rivers look the same meeting the sea these open streets, looking up the same trees whose branches silhouette above the low roof lines, the freight trains, sonorous and uneven when they call up these same hills, catch up to my legs and their older, strong steps, walking the same trails down the ravine to see the salmon return every fall, and finally, this fall. Thank you, Arian. that was beautiful. I loved reading that poem in the collection um, and, you know, it just invokes such a sense of place um, and speaks so much truth. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Um, okay, Rena, we would love to hear a poem from you, maybe something out of the collection. Sure, yeah. Um... Well, I guess I'll read up, but people have asked why I don't have a poem in the collection and I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's because we had a set page count that we were trying to stay within and it was really, really hard for me to stay within that page count and I could not, uh, I could not bear to sacrifice someone else's poem to stick my poem in there. <laughs> so, so I don't have a poem in the collection. Um, and I, I thought, well, I'll write the preface and that'll be enough. Um, but I think there are, I have two salmon poems that if I were going to put them in the collection, this might be one of them. And it's called Remembering Tata at Tamquixen. And Tata is an affectionate word for mother and Tamquixen is, um, 
is a place name for Gooseberry Point, which is where I grew up. A glossary of bell-related words, chimes, sings, peals, tolls. It is a feeling of silver. It rings and shines. Sorry, it's been a long time since I've read this poem. <laughs> it rings and shines at the edges. Like the scales of a fish, it flickers. Tintinabulates the signal of a charm, of magic, of a movie memory sequence. And then there is Mother home from the cannery, covered in the scales of hundreds of gutted fish. She shimmers like a mermaid. Long day, I ask. When I lunch at noon, she replies, the sky is a polished silver spoon. By quitting time, tarnish has overtaken all signs of shine. That's how long the day is. You must have cleaned a lot of fish, I say. I think we cleaned out all of Puget Sound. There used to be gooseberries at Gooseberry Point. Now there is the cannery. Won't be long before all the fish are gone. Then the cannery will go and all we'll have is hunger and sorrow. A burden is the heaviest bell of a carillon. Its register is low. I wish I had a magic wand to chime the cheerful sound of gooseberries springing up out of the ground. So um, one thing I should explain, because I saw uh, someone related to this poem that it resonated with them and they reposted an excerpt of it. <laughs> and I realized that without the whole thing and the context, um, when I say, I think we cleaned out all of Puget Sound and me being clackdamish, that the assumption is that we uh, Indian fishers are out there cleaning out Puget Sound with all the fishing we're doing. <laughs> and that's not the case, actually. Um, something you should know is that the largest cannery in the world was here in Bellingham, Washington um, in the 1800s. And it's during that time, indigenous fishers were not allowed to be on the water. And the harvest was so grotesque that they couldn't process all the fish that they that they caught in the fish traps. Um, and so it's in our oral history that, uh, that a lot of the fish were just dumped back out into the bay um, and they would wash up on the rocks and it would be really smelly. Um, so the cannery, knowing that this is a bad look, they... Um, decided to pile the fish onto heaps uh, on a barge and then put it out in the middle of the bay. And I never knew this until I did a reading. I read this poem at a poetry reading and a woman came up to me and she said, you know, my father grew up in Bellingham. And she told me the story of him seeing this barge out there and asking his father, what is that? You know, what is that out in the middle of the bay? And his father explained to him what, it, you know, about the canneries and the piles of fish. So I just want to clarify that <laughs> it was not indigenous people, it was not Lummies cleaning out all of Puget Sound. It was Lummy women who worked in the canneries after uh, our traditional way of, inter of life was interrupted by the canneries. Um, and it was uh, criminalized. It was, it was a crime for indigenous fishers to be out on the water. We didn't get the right back until 1975 with the passing of U.S. versus Washington, the jo George Bolt decision. So just making that clear. <laughs> um, and there's a footnote in the book, but, you know, it, taken out of context, it's, it sounds like another thing. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that really important history. Um, and there's just so much to learn, I think, about our, our region and the things that have happened here. And I think this collection of poems is just one tool in the toolbox. Um, and I'd love to start with some questions now that we've, I've prepared for both of you, but, um, the first one is a little bit, um, to you, Rena, just because I want to hear more about just the history behind this collection. Um, you've compiled an incredible collection of poems from over 150 poets. Um, as I mentioned earlier, people from all across the map, all different backgrounds, um, from authors uh, that are you know from age seven to you know people in their 90s 
Um, so what was your experience putting together this collection and what inspired you to take on such a project? Well, it was really wonderful to do this work. I learned so much about salmon that I didn't even know. Uh, like, in, you know, in Ariane's poem that she read, she talks about how the fish turn one last time to, to let the scent wash over them. Like things like that, details about that sacred journey that they make. Um, I didn't know this, but there's a poem by Judith Roche um, called The Salmon the uh, the Salmon Sweets. And it it was at um, the Ballard Locks is where I first encountered it. And I went back looking for it and it's not there anymore. And so I like searched and searched and searched for this poem. Um, and it's a series of poems. And I, I found it and I was so happy. It was like a, it was, um, it was a community effort, really. The people like, you know, this connection led me to that connection, led me to this connection. And I talked to so many people about it and then finally found it. And it was, it was a real blessing to be able to include it. But she talks about how when they're going out to the ocean, they make that journey facing where they're going to go back to. So they go backwards the whole way down. And I thought that was really astounding and very cool. So I, putting it together was wonderful. It started um, really back in 2018. I was invited to uh, be a, an associate editor on the Orca Anthology that Jill McCabe Johnson and Andrew Shattuck McBride put together um, called For the Love of Orcas. And I really, really wanted to be able to do that, but I was just kind of swamped. And, and so I said, you know, I really, I can't, I can't work on this right now. And Andrew and I had a meeting at um, the Pickford Film Center. They had, you know, good popcorn in their lobby. And so we just met up there and we were visiting and he said, well, what would your dream project be? And I said, you know, I would really love to do an anthology of salmon someday. And then, you know, kind of fast forward four and a half, five years later, and then there I am in the role of Poet Laureate, and I'm applying for funding from um, for the fellowship from Academy of American Poets. And um, I thought this should be the project. This should be my project. And so I proposed the Salmon Anthology, and it got funded, and I was super psyched about that. And um of course, like a lot of these kinds of exciting things that, you know, fellowships and stuff, you have to keep it a secret until they announce it officially. <laughs> and so they, they, I, they, it was supposed to be in June, they were going to announce, but for some reason they waited until August. And so um, for the timeline to be able to complete it, you know, publish it and have it be out by the time uh, while I was still Poet Laureate, um, that meant that I had to close submissions by October 1st so I could get the manuscript to the editor or to the um, publisher, I mean, by December 1st. <laughs> and so I put the call out for submissions in August and I was like, two months, you know, we'll see. I, I got on submittable and, and made a submittable call and everything. And I thought maybe we'll get 100, 100 poems and we'll be able to put a nice collection together. And it was so shocking and wonderful how many people responded to the call for submissions. I had no idea that there were so many people out there writing about salmon so lovingly. Um, so I got more than 300 poets submitted poems. They submitted over 700 poems. And <laughs> that was a lot to sift through. Like I was soliciting poems from friends because I thought there was not going to be <laughs> enough poems. I was like, hey, um, if you should send me a salmon poem, you know, and um, I even extorted one poem. Someone asked me for a blurb and I was like, I'll write you a blurb if you send me a salmon poem. Um, and then I, little did I know that there was this onslaught of poems coming my way. And I really loved reading everything. There were so many, I mean, so much made it in, but there were also poems that I just had like it killed me it was agony to not be able to include it um so just because of of like cost restraints and time res time restraints um for space but it, it was really a wonderful process to, to be engaged in and then well like you read the blurb from Timothy Egan I thought well this is a long shot because I write in my preface about part of the inspiration being reading his book, The Good Rain, and he interviews Billy Frank Jr. Um, and I just love like 
the way that Billy Frank Jr. talks about the salmon. And so that's in the preface. And I thought I should ask Timothy Egan if he'll blurb the book. And it was kind of a long shot, but he did. And I was so excited. He like wrote so beautifully about it. And I, I was just really honored and pleased. Um, but yeah, all the little things, it, it was very special. Like the artwork, um, the cover art, this is um, by a Squaxin Island poet named Joe Seymour. And, or not, sorry, he's an artist. He just got his MFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts in visual arts. And um, this is his first, so he normally works in OVA form and, uh, you know, doing the traditional forms. And this is his first um, departure from that. And it's called The Run That Once Was. And I just love his use of colors and the way that he makes the salmon look like waves. It's just really cool. So I'm pleased with how that turned out. And then inside the graphic, um, that there, that is called the egg. And that's by a Lummi tribal member named Jason LeClaire. And I know he has, he, he makes earrings. I have earrings that are done in that graph. I should have worn them tonight. I was going to say, I wish I had a salmon shirt, but I have salmon earrings. And um, anyhow, it was really cool to be able to communicate with a lot of these poets about their work and, um, and to put it all together and, and then see where it ended up too is really exciting. It's been on, um, small press distribution's top 10 list. Um, it's been number one, I think three times now. Um, no, no, twice, July and October was number one um, seller uh, nationwide um, in poetry. So it's really cool. Um, and also I should say that the, um, so we we donated with, with part of the grant was to donate um, 400 copies went to Washington State Libraries. Um, proceeds from the collection go to Empty Bull Press in their work to publish Washington State Poets. Um, and they made a donation, a sizable donation to um, Save Our Wild Salmon. So it's, it's doing a lot of good, not just in um, spreading the joy and the love um, and celebrating salmon, it's also um, kind of putting a little bit of funding towards good good things, salmon and poets, and can library I, goers. <laughs> can I jump in, Julie, with like two little things about it too? Please, yes. On like all the cool places that this anthology is going and all the cool stuff it's doing, um, I've started working with the Women's Correctional Center in Gig Harbor. And one of the folks there like, had this like they brought it to our poetry session and we're like really excited about it they were like yeah. um and so it's like also like uh being a good thing for folks in prisons which is so cool to see um and rena had asked me to do some copy editing for this so i got to copy edit the front and the back matter of the book not the poems because uh, as rena has said there are so many um and i really like to advocate for people to spend time reading the bios. I would not have done it unless I was like doing it to make sure they were all pretty and nice. Um, but they're so fun and magical and really gave me so many ideas on like, my bio is boring and people are doing such cool stuff, expressing themselves and thinking about how they want to be seen. And just there's so many very cool and interesting people in this that come out even just in one paragraph about them. So like, spend time reading about the contributors because they're really interesting. It's true. Yeah, that was cool. I um I enjoyed the bios too. A lot of a lot of that, you know, I'm like, ah, I would like to know that person. <laughs> I know. There were so many fun things to read when I was looking through it. And I was just, it's really inspiring to see people just from all different experiences. Um and you know, people might not think, oh, I'm not a poet you know, that sort of feeling, but it's sort of like, you know, some people, it was their first time writing poetry. Um, and I just think that that was really encouraging um, to read. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing about just kind of the history of the project. And I think it's just such a awesome and special gift to, you know, our region. 
Um, but I would love to know, you know, my next question I have for each of you is, um, and maybe this is a little broad, but, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll see where it goes, but what is the significance of salmon to your art, your culture, and what you think it is, the significance of it to our world as, as a whole? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'll go. Um, I think that, so Sa Sam, I'm going to actually respond to that with, by reading a poem. I do that sometimes. This is how I roll. Okay. This is by a Bellingham poet named Phelps McElvain. And I, it's so beautiful. I got to tell you this one. So every year here in Whatcom County, and I want to tell everyone about this. Um, if, if you're a Whatcom County writer, you're eligible to enter into the Susie Boynton Poetry Contest. And the um, winners get their poems printed on a brass plaque and put outside of the, the Bellingham Public Library. But if you're a finalist, which is even cooler, in my opinion, your poem goes up on uh, the city bus and it's illustrated. And so it's up there um, on the city bus. And so everybody who rides the bus gets to read it. And my daughter um, rides the bus to the university. She sent this poem to me. She took a picture and she sent it to me. And I was like, oh, I hope he sent he sent it because I wouldn't have known how to find him otherwise. But luckily it was in the submission you. Um, and so I was really psyched about it because it's so beautiful. This is Phelps McElvain. Water by Salmon. As life is taught by death and the sun by space, so clouds are taught by land and rains by place. As mountains are taught by plains and rivers by lakes, so trees are taught by soils and elements by their weight. As deserts are taught by shores and ocean waves by wind, so depth is taught by height and tides by celestial spin. As sound is taught by silence and insight by reason, so humans are taught by water and water by salmon. And I feel like um, part of what makes this collection so uh so relatable and compelling is that the salmon's journey is inspiring it's like the hero's journey right like all human stories love that that hero's journey of like going oh like being born leaving your place of origin going having an adventure and then returning home victorious to bring gifts for the people right like that is the salmon's journey that's their story and it's beautiful and it's relatable and um we can learn so much from what they give in terms of like generosity and resilience and persistence the way that you know if you if you've ever seen a salmon like struggle up through rapids it's it's amazing they're just there's videos I, if you ever are having like a really hard day <laughs> and things just seem impossible and you just feel like you're going against the current go and watch some salmon try to get upstream and it's just so inspiring it's so beautiful um so I feel like that is that is how I'm influenced by them directly kind of in day-to-day -day, you know stuff but culturally um Lummi is a, is a salmon culture, it's a fishing culture, and all of our cosmology and, you know, sacred belief systems are um, respectful of that gift. And we invented a technology called the reef net, and it's more than 10,000 years old, and it it's, um, was unique to straight Salish tribes, so Lummi, Saanich, um, my people. And the cosmology, it's, it's a, so the nets were woven by family matriarchs and the matriarchs would contribute a panel to the net. And then the, the net was, you know, these panels were stitched together. So it was like a community effort. Um, and it ensured her family, a portion of the catch. And so, uh, in, in the way that it's shaped, like there's two anchors and then the canoes and then, you know, the, there's a false reef. They created a false reef, like by tying 
um, eelgrass to nettles, um, anchor lines going across. It's kind of hard to, unless you have a picture, but it creates a false reef. And so the salmon swim up that and into the net. And then at the given moment, like when they're right there, the uh, skipper will yell a word and then everybody lifts from the two canoes that are um, anchored across from each other. And um, then they bring the catch into the canoes. And so it's really beautiful, but the idea, it, it's modeled after a womb, that the net is a womb and it's to provide the spark of life for the, the new year coming. Um, so I think that's pretty beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Arian, I'd love to hear from you too. I love hearing you talk about the fish, Rena. It makes me so happy. Um, so my tribes are not salmon people. We're from far away. Um, we're from like the Mississippi River and the swamps in the Southeast. Um, and so very different ecosystem, but I grew up here. And so I've always been around the fish. Um, and I grew up kind of on the edge of a forest that has a salmon stream in it. Um, and like my elementary school was also like tucked into it. My class never did this, but most classes would like raise and release salmon with the hatchery there because um, there's a hatchery on part of the stream. Um, and so I grew up with just like the fisher there in high school. Um, I did the volunteer program they had being a salmon steward, which is where you go out in the freezing November and December weekends and get rained on and talk to anyone who will listen about how cool the fish are. Um, my best friend and I did that. Um, and so it was fun. It was a great way to also learn so much about the salmon because we had to like become familiar with and memorize a massive amount of information so that we could answer a lot of different questions that people had and also like advise them on how to like interact respectfully with the stream during spawning season and had like little visuals like I don't know I feel like every kid who grows up in the northwest at some point sees the little like row of glass tubes with all the salmon stages in them I don't know if that's been your experience but I definitely was like there's always they were there um and so the fish were just always there and you go and you see them. And it's been really fun to get to introduce that to a lot of the people in my life, especially a lot of folks who have moved from out of town, um, friends or friends who just didn't grow up um, close enough to a stream to be part of that. Um, and I still go see them every year in, in my home creek. I go back to see them. And it's been cool to see how I feel like in recent years, there have been a lot more people coming to see the salmon spawn and cheer them on. So especially like I have videos on my phone of the salmon struggling because the creek is very shallow. And so they have to turn on their sides and then they're just doing this across these like long beds of rocks and gravel to get up to the next part where they can like kind of rest for a minute. And when the fish is like really struggling or if they're like getting sucked back down like a little waterfall, um, but they're like trying not to like the people all along the banks will be like cheering and be like come on come on you got it and it's been so sweet to see more people coming out and like cheering on the fish and there to like watch their struggle and like energetically support them I feel like I didn't see that as much when I was a kid so it makes me feel good that I think more folks who don't grow up knowing about the salmon necessarily or don't grow up with that in their culture are starting to incorporate it and bring the fish into their yearly rhythm. That makes me really happy. And to bond with them. It feels so associative of like, your struggle is my struggle, let's go. It's beautiful. Yeah, the solidarity, I love that. Um, and it's, you know, it's such a special thing here. Um, I, I grew up in the central coast of California the, where the Salinan and Chumash people are. and. Um, we have things called Salmon Creek, but it just feels, but there's no salmon anymore and there hasn't been salmon for so long. And so um, moving up to the Northwest, you know, it's so special that these, it's still here, it's still happening. It's still, you know, it's something to really, um, you know, that we want to protect um, because it's so sacred. Um, and I think I might, skip to a different one just because we're kind of talking about that, uh, the sacredness of salmon, but um, uh, many of us may know this or not, but uh, 14 population groups of steelhead and Chinook, coho, chum, and sockeye salmon in Washington state are listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so what are some things that, you know, either of you could say that uh, the public can do to protect our salmon populations and help them thrive?
I'd say that you, um, everyone is in a very unique position to be able to contribute something to, to this, to this fight um, for those populations. And, you know, for me, I'm a poet. And so, <laughs> and I had this really awesome platform for a couple of years where I could, you know, and so I was like, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it for the salmon. So whatever it is, wherever you are located um, in your life path, um, you have something to contribute in some way. I mean, like, it doesn't even make sense that a poet would be able to contribute. You know, I mean, like, what am I going to do for salmon? But it turns out that there's this like really beautiful thing that can be done. So you just kind of have to search what you, you know, what it is um, that you can do and everyone has a role to play and something to give. And I'm gonna do this again where I read a poem in response to that question. And again, it's a Bellingham poet and it's Rob Lewis. Um, he has a book called The Silence of Vanishing Things and it's really beautiful and it's poems and essays about um, endangered species and um, how they don't, you know, they don't have a voice. We have to be their voice. And so he's their voice in that collection um, in his book, The Silence of Vanishing Things. And I took this poem from there and um, it just, it speaks so well. It says, it's called, I went looking for the wild one. I went looking for the wild one, the howler, the Vedic tramp, the one for whom the wounded hillsides are inner burns, whose blood is stained with the old love wine of poet and earth. Warrior poet, slinging battle flack out at the static, shattering polite conversations everywhere. I looked in the anthologies, listening for echoes, traced for signs in the quarterlies, magazines, best ofs. I learned it's been a good year for poetry, grants and awards coming in, contests and prizes proliferating, the wise gray consensus counsels a return to the classics. Meanwhile, poor salmon scientist holds extinction in a palm full of numbers with nothing but data to howl with. And I love that poem um, because, you know, it talks, it, it acknowledges that like that science can take us so far and that work is super valuable. We need that work. It definitely is, you know, we need those numbers um, to understand exactly what's going on, but how, like, it's the job of the poets to make them howl. It's the job of um, our media, it's the job of our politicians, our elected officials, our resource managers, tribal officials, everybody has a role to play in in howling for the salmon, right? Like, um, and, and if your path is tangential, like if it's just adjacent to the salmon, <laughs> cause um that's still part of the salmon cause right because it's everything is connected and uh, the the old ones the old people they understood that and so if you're working in water or forests as he mentions um i went looking for the wild one uh for whom the wounded hillsides are inner burns right like you see that clear cut that impacts the salmon so if you're in forestry or water or whatever it is um uh, communications, heck, insurance, um, <laughs> whatever it is, it's, it's relevant and it has, um, it, it has a connection to the salmon because they are a keystone species. They touch everything in this whole region. I think thinking about Rena's point about like, there are so many ways, different people, and like you have your unique gifts. I think one of my things that I'm very good at is getting people like one-on-one -on -one or sometimes in groups excited about things and so like I'm like trying to get everyone I know and like you you know more people than you think like and they're in all sorts of different industries that just like taking them down and being like come this weekend we'll bring a thermos of tea and we'll go watch the salmon and you can ask me any questions you have um and people get excited they like like it and some of them go back on their own um so like spreading that little excitement and like building those connections um, I think if everyone had a felt connection to the salmon, we wouldn't need to talk about protecting them. We'd just do it. Um, but I think also there's like, you know, there's like the little things that they 
taught us when I was a salmon steward of like keep your dogs out of the streams because the salmon are like oh no a predator and it also messes up the stream bed and can disturb the nest so like keep your dogs on leash out of streams stuff like that but also so much of this is systemic and about policy like Rena was saying like the bolt decision was a huge thing for indigenous fishing rights and for salmon protection and things like that so like if you want to call your representatives and like be in correspondence with them around the legislation that does affect the fish, does affect the rivers. Um, Save Our Wild Salmon, the organization that Rena mentioned, they are a good place to start to like keep up with that because they do those campaigns and they are involved in those things of like dam removal, river restoration, policies that affect this stuff. So there's like the, the personal connection, but there's also so much systemic change that has to happen which is not like a cute answer, but. It's a real answer, it's important. <laughs> I thought it was cute. <laughs> yeah, and to kind of build off of, um, you know, Rena mentioned that salmon are keystone species. And um, if people don't know what that means, it essentially means that um, without them, whole ecosystems could collapse. Um, it kind of what is holding, you know, the whole system together. So if they go, a lot of other things go. It's kind of like a domino effect sort of thing. And when I was preparing for this event, I was, you know, it really got me thinking about salmon and poetry and how they're related. And I just had this thought, I was like, poetry is a keystone species <laughs> for humans. I was like, because imagine our world without poetry, imagine our world without art, right? And so I guess, how do you all see poetry um, as a vital part of our humanity, just like salmon, you know, are a vital part of um, our ecosystem? I think one thing I think about with poetry, um, like it's very notable to me that in a lot of explicitly fascist governments, poets are some of the first who are uh, carted off. And I think that can't not be significant. Um, poets are often like the kind of the watchers, the record keepers, we're largely forgotten by market forces, frequently to our own detriment, but like we don't have as many market forces acting on our work because it's not profitable. Um, and so there's a lot of freedom that we have to talk about things and to be very vocal and very honest. And so I feel like poetry is kind of this like, it's also so embodied. Um, I feel like poetry, people, I think people get very afraid of poetry because they think they have to analyze it until they understand it. But I don't think poetry has much to do with the head at all. I think it's a very body based form because poetry is so sensory. It's based on the things you can perceive and feel with all your different things that perceive and feel. Um, and so it's like this embodied voice of watching. And that's, how could that not be very important? Definitely. I, I, um, oh, poetry, I think, so, I don't know if I can say, I don't know, I don't think I have anything to add to that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was very well said um yeah. you know I I think that um I've always felt that way too about poetry that it's um uh it almost exists exists in its own realm a little bit um and I've always like kind of the sort of lack of rules in a way um you know I mean there's all different forms of poetry but um and even in this collection and um, people use facialness uh, the way the poem is laid out on the page. Um, I'll see if I do a quick, oh yeah, wow, I just, I literally opened right to it. That's perfect. Um, but you can see, you know, there's so many different ways to communicate um, what you're trying to say um, with poetry. It's like more tools in the toolbox kind of thing. So I think it's just such a um, beautiful art form. Um, and I guess it's my uh, last question and then we can maybe then move on to some Q&A and a couple more poem readings, um, is um, thinking about uh, the, in this poetry collection, the concept of home. It's a huge um, 
I think thing that's talked about with salmon and that, you know, at the end of their life, um, they turn around and they come home. And as I learned today, which is such a cool new fact that as they're going out to the ocean, they turn to look at home one last time before they, they go out, which I think is so awesome. Um, but I guess uh, the beauty and tradition of the fall salmon is something like a, a homecoming. So how do you blend the idea of home um, or the idea of being at home uh, into your poetry? Um, I don't think I can make any generalizations, but I can speak to the specific poem I read earlier, um, which for me is very much about home. And whenever I read it, I like see see the streets and see the ravine. Um, and those are really, I have like a couple poems that I wrote when I lived back in my uh, neighborhood I grew up in for a time. And all of the poems are so precious to me because I can feel just like home being an animate space within them because of that like power of image of like, um, but in that one specifically, I'm just paging through it. Um, it was like, I think the poem touches on this, but like it was like very difficult for me to move back to the neighborhood I grew up in because I didn't have a good home life growing up. like. The forest and the streets were very beautiful, safe places for me, but home was a bad place. Um, and so I was kind of afraid to move back to the neighborhood because I didn't know how that was going to go for me. Um, but I didn't really have a choice because I couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Um, and it ended up being really beautiful of like this returning home and being like, no, this was actually the parts that were home to me in a good way are still home to me in a good way. And that, that feeling of home was still there and that's been especially important to me with like Seattle going through so many structural massive changes and like this is my hometown and my hometown is rapidly slipping out from under me as massive tech companies shift the economic landscape dramatically as uh, policy changes at the city level affect how everything is structured and built um, and so finding something that still felt like the good parts of home that I remembered was extremely healing for me. And I thought all the time about the salmon, especially because I was living on the other side of the forest from where I had grown up and like even closer to the stream. And they're just right there. For me, home, um, like Lummi is is home. It'll always be home, right? Um, I often dream of making a home somewhere in the sunshine somewhere with tacos, somewhere, somewhere with like, uh, you know, 80 degrees in October, things like that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my, my mom has always said, oh, you know, go have your adventures. Lummy will always be home. And I, um, I feel like when I have gone away from home and made home elsewhere, um, having those adventures and stuff it is it's just kind of it's really cliche to say home is where the heart is <laughs> but you know it's just like you, home is just wherever you are at um and I don't know like it, I don't know that's a good that's a good question like as my work changes um I think it's place-based this is something I've learned about myself um when I was in New York I wrote the collection that call, was called Patriarchy Blues. Um, that tells you something about New York, <laughs> um, which is true. Uh, and I was at Sarah Lawrence at the time. And, you know, like I didn't grow up like with an understanding of feminism or anything like that. I remember one time, I so I encountered it first when I was at Western and we were reading Laura Mulvey's essay about the male gaze. And I was like, this is really, I'm trying to get this. Like, I'm trying, you know, trying to get this. And I asked my mom, I was like, mom, were you ever a feminist? And she said, heck no, I wanted men to open doors for me. And I was like, okay, so that's feminism. But like, um, or, or I didn't really understand, like burning your bra. She's like, I'm going to burn my bra. And uh, I was it just had no idea. Right. And then, but I think partially that might be because um, there is still some feeling of like the matriarchy being in place in tribal, in my tribal community, you know, it's always like, go ask your mom. <laughs> it's, it's, um, 
I never felt like oppressed by the patriarchy until I moved to New York and I was at Sarah Lawrence and all my, uh, my, the women in my cohort were sharing their stories and their experiences. And, you know, I started to kind of look around and pay attention to how culture is, is there. And, you know, and then I was like, oh, okay. All right. I get it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that first collection came out of, of my home being made somewhere else. My second collection, I kind of feel like I lived in my cubicle at work. Um, and so the internet was my home <laughs> when I was writing that that book. Um, and when I became the poet laureate and I was like, okay, Washington State, Washington. I'm a Washingtonian, pretty much like lifelong. I've I've spent, I, I won't tell you how old I am, but I've spent like 35 years in Washington state, which kind of feels like too long. Um, and at Lummi and in Bellingham. And so the, the poems that I wrote were all like, okay, here I am. I'm here. I'm home. These are the poems. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if that said it was answer your question, but <laughs> no, yeah, it's, I mean, it's all part of it, you know, where we are uh, physically and home can shift so much during our life um, and how it affects our art. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for um, answering uh, these uh, questions. I, um, we do have uh, some questions. And uh, the first one is from Leslie, and there's one for each of you. So, um, Rena, what projects are you working on now? And then, Arian, uh, when are you coming to Bellingham to read? <laughs> My answer is really short. I was in Bellingham on Sunday. I I do this. <laughs> Um, but if you want to keep up with my calendar, there is on the Arts Wall and Hum Wall websites for the Poet Laureate stuff. Um, you can just see any upcoming events. But yeah, I was in Bellingham three days ago and it was so fun that the Whatcom Libraries put together an incredible festival. Reno was there. Um, and it was so much fun. I had such a good time and everyone should go next year because it was an incredibly good festival. Yeah, that was the inaugural event too. That was the first time they've done it and it was great. Um, it was great. You were great. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was so good. Um, my newest, my latest project, I'm still trying to get my, uh, I finally found a publisher for my collection, um, Dancing to the Ticking of the Doomsday Clock. I don't, you know, like the publishers, I think they were scared by that title, but I like it. So I, I insisted, um, but I found a publisher. So I'm trying to get that manuscript just finalized and out the door. And um, probably by the end of the year, that'll be. Um, so next year, it'll be published next, next fall. We're anticipating November. Um, but the fun thing that's happening on Friday you should come if you're in Bellingham. I'm doing a show with um, a few other aunties and the show is called The Aunties and it's um, Coast Salish storytelling. I'm so excited. Diane Million, who is a scholar and professor at University of Washington, is going to be sharing the stage with myself and another uh, Lummi tribal member and educator named Heather Jefferson. And I'm just really excited. We've been preparing for that all week, like, the, well, for longer than that, really. But um, the run up to it has been really exciting. Um, they were just here earlier today interviewing me. So I, this has been a long day of like me talking, um, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's this Friday at seven o'clock at the Mount Baker Theater, and you can look look it up um, at the Mount Baker Theater. And I'm going to give you guys a code for half tick, half off tickets because you're here, and if you want to go, um, the code is all caps Ocean Sun, and um, 
I, I can also put the link to buy the tickets if you want. I'll have to look for it, but that's that's what I'm doing. And there's um an essay that I just wrote coming out in the city of Seattle's website, I think. Um, and the theme is land back and it's called land back fish back. And so if you wanna know more, um, I can, well, I don't have a link for that yet, but once it goes live, I will. So I don't know, I guess search for me in a, in a few weeks, uh, <laughs> search land back fish back if you're interested. But in the meantime, I'll go find that other link. Hey, thanks so much. Um, probably have time for maybe one, two more questions. Um, I personally really like this uh, next one from Neil and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put this one in the chat too. Um, so, uh, I know you both just appeared at a huge library event in Whatcom County on Sunday, which we're just talking about. Um, what has your, been your relationship with libraries, both growing up and currently? I'll chat while Rena's looking for the link. Um, I love libraries. Libraries are my happy place. I love libraries so much that I thought I wanted to work in them. I tried working in them in middle school school and all through college and then also several years ago in a public library system I went to library school before dropping out to become a poet and realized through all of these that what I really wanted was to hang out in libraries I don't want to work in libraries I want to do my work in a library but they're my happy places and libraries are also I think unsung heroes of access and like societal access like they really are dedicated to making sure that uh, across lines of disability, across lines of like access to housing or incarcerated status, all those things that people can get resources, find what they're looking for, whether it's like how to do home improvement or like finding a job. A lot of libraries do like job training programs. They have resources to learn new skills and languages, including English, but also including lots of other languages. They have fun comics, they have poetry sections, they have novels. They have little programs. The Tacoma Library did this really cute thing last year where it was kind of like, it felt like giving yourself a present because the librarians had picked out a bunch of books they liked and then wrapped them in brown paper and tied them with a little string and then just put on them like some key words that might tell you whether or not this book might be for you. So you wouldn't pick up something like if you were like really squeamish, you wouldn't pick up something with gore in it. But like, and you didn't know what you were checking out. And then you would check it out and like get to unwrap it. And this like specially chosen thing by a librarian for you is so magical. So I think libraries are one of the coolest places that exist. I think they should be heavily funded, heavily loved and heavily used. I agree on all of that. Um, I also love to work in libraries. Uh, whenever I visit a university, I want to go see their library. Universities have beautiful libraries. Um, just something about this place being where the books live is just really, really special. Um, <laughs> and librarians are great too. Uh, I actually... When after so after my grandma passed, I learned something about her that she the, so on Lummi Island, um, they have a little library right by the ferry dock, and my uh, so on the res side, my grandma lived at the top of the hill, um, leading down to the ferry, and so she would run away to the library like she had eight kids, right. Um, <laughs> But even after like they were all grown, she would run away to the library on Lummi Island. She would ride the little five minute ferry ride across and go to the library and hang out, hide out over there. <laughs> and I did not know this until um, sometime after she passed, uh, the librarian who is also the, the mother of one of my childhood friends, she said, oh, I just used to love your grandma, Rena. And I was like, how did you know my grandma? Because it just is like very unlikely, like how on earth would Carly know my grandma? And she said, oh yeah, she used to come to the library all the time on the island. And I was like, oh my God, of course she did. Um, you know, so they are, they are um, a refuge for people wanting quiet and um and to have experiences and encountering like ideas and things that you know you want and, and they're they're like everywhere there are more libraries in Washington state than there are Starbucks 
like by four times, there are four times more libraries, which is wonderful um, because you think a Starbucks is everywhere, but there's like literally a library everywhere. Um, so anything that you need, you just go there and get it. And it's just fabulous, like for free. It's so cool. It's amazing. Yeah, it's very rare to be able to be in a space um, anymore in our society where you don't have to buy anything in order to exist there. So yes, I'm a little biased, but I also think they're pretty cool. <laughs> and not only do you like not have to buy anything, but there are all these people around you who are like, please, resources, I want them, I want you to have them. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's, um, it's very special. Um, and I think we have time for one more question and then we'll do a couple, read a couple poems, but uh, this one here is kind of about uh, climate change. Um, and if you could talk a bit about the climate change division of Washington Fish and Wildlife Project uh, involving poets in the state's bioregion. Um, are either of you involved in this or know anything about it? No, okay, well, that's something for us to maybe look into uh, with the Washington Fish and Wildlife. Um, and like we were talking about how everybody has different tools um, in advocacy, um, you know, poetry is definitely, definitely one of them. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you all for or asking such uh, thoughtful questions. Um, and we would just love to uh, end the night with a couple of poems, uh, one from Rena and one from Ariane. And I'll kind of let it be up to you who wants, who wants to go first. And yeah, and we'll close it out. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then Rena can close us down, which feels nice because Rena made this magical bookie. Um, there are like so many poems I love so much in this collection, but um, this one is really nice. Uh, it's called The Ones Who Walk Again it's by Katie E. Ellis. Um, so here is this poem. And if anyone's following along at home, it's on page 131. Um, the ones who walk again. A Duwamish man told the story in my daughter's grade school assembly. He drummed open a world of children who walk into the water and who return as salmon for the villagers to eat. Now she worries beyond reason for the salmon boys and salmon girls, the ones who will not walk again should the drying bones of our last night's dinner not be returned to sea. Always the ocean down our street keeps up its chop and spit and rush and I sack lunches, pay bills, wash clothes, and cycle spinning my hand-me-down stories, the ones I will not give her. She plucks each bone of a heart-held story from the dish in her hands and feed them to, feeds them to the waves that slosh against her legs, growing sturdy as the underpinnings of a miles-long pier. I love that poem. I love that poem, too. Yeah, so many good poems. Oh, okay. I'll just read, um, I guess I'll read the salmon, the other salmon poem that have, it's called Songs on the Salmon Scale. A salmon is a song sung in rounds, a series of concentric circles, like a raindrop in the sea, rippling out and returning. A series of concentric circles, a chorus and a verse, rippling out and returning in a shining body of treasure. A chorus and a verse, a hero home from adventure in a shining body of treasure bearing gifts from the deep. A hero home from adventure like a raindrop on the sea bearing gifts from the deep. A salmon is a song sung in rounds. And that's in the Beaches book. I love that. A salmon is a song sung in rounds. I feel like that's just a perfect way to close out our night. Um, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge and art with us. Um, we're so grateful. Um, and for everybody in the audience, this will be recorded and hopefully in the next week or two posted on KCLS 
YouTube page. So if you want to share it out um, with anyone who couldn't be here tonight, um, this will be accessible to them. Um, yeah, and just thank you again. And I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time.